Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we should get started uh, five minutes late. So yesterday we discussed the uh, Blanford snipe mechanism and did sort of all the math and uh, trying to convince you that uh, we can actually extract rotational energy from a uh, rapidly rotating black hole. So we've seen that as we put a, a rotating black hole into an externally applied uh, magnetic field, <clears throat> that magnetic field will actually uh, induce an electric field. And if you sort of throw in charges into these electric magnetic fields, these charges will try to screen that electric field. And <clears throat> in doing so, they drive a current, which we showed is actually um, a, a poloidal current. And that actually drives the, uh, uh, the sort of extraction of uh, electromagnetic energy uh, of rotational energy via electromagnetic fields from the black hole. And <clears throat> so I briefly wanted to discuss also like how we can actually realize this in, in astrophysical scenarios, meaning in, in, in our context in uh, long and in short GRBs, because that's sort of what, we, uh, what is widely believed to be uh, sort of the central engine of uh, short and long uh, GRBs. So, so far we've just looked at highly idealized conditions, and the question is how can we actually realize them in, in, in practice. <clears throat> and uh, so let's first discuss uh, the long uh, GRBs, and as uh, Sylvia told us yesterday, uh, we believe that uh, the progenitors of these long GRBs are actually uh, so-called collapse stars, so rapidly rotating uh, very massive stars uh, that, who, uh, that collapse at the end of their lives, and uh, collapse to a black hole surrounded by some accretion disk. And uh, I'm going to discuss this in, in a little bit more detail uh, later today. So the uh, essential idea is we have this rapidly rotating massive star uh, that collapses to form a black hole. And since the material is rapidly uh, rotating and has a lot of angular momentum, uh, the material can ideally fall in and accrete onto the black hole, but instead the angular momentum has to be conserved. So what the material does is essentially it uh, uh, falls into, uh, sort of falls onto the uh, sort of equatorial um, uh, plane uh, in sort of elliptical orbits and then sort of quickly uh, circularizes around that black hole and forms uh, the circular flow around the, the black hole uh, that we call uh, an accretion disk, uh, as you can see here. And then sort of the idea is that, um, maybe I should draw this on the blackboard in a, as a small sketch. And, and essentially the idea is then that, so we have this black hole, and we have this accretion flow around. And in principle, the idea is that sort of MHD turbulence So somehow we have to supply um, a magnetic field to that black hole. We can do this in two ways. We can either endow the original star uh, prior to collapse with sort of a large scale magnetic field that may even extend to the sort of exterior of the star. And we just collapse this to a black hole and its, uh, and its uh, um, accretion disk, and in, as, as it collapses, the magnetic flux sort of compresses and uh, puts a magnetic field, sort of large-scale magnetic field, uh, on, this, on this black hole. Um, the other mechanism how we can supply a magnetic field to the black hole is uh, sort of uh, more intrinsic in the sense, or more natural in the sense that as soon as you have this accretion disk formed around the black hole, uh, there will be uh, MHD instabilities going on in this disk because of the differential rotation of, of the accretion disk. Uh, the so-called magnetorotational instability will uh, actually uh, mediate turbulence, and that turbulence uh, sort of mediates angular momentum transport, so it forces uh, material to slowly accrete onto, onto the black hole, so it falls into the, the potential. So magnetic flux is generated and is sort of accreted uh, onto that black hole. Eventually, these magnetic fields uh, reach the black hole, uh, sort of open up 
and, uh, uh, and can also produce some uh, uh, sort of threat the black hole, the, the ergosphere, uh, which we see is critical for actually launching this black hole uh, uh, blendfold snag mechanism. Um, and sort of that is the, 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 the sort of other idea how you could potentially supply a magnetic field to the black hole. Now, this has been tried in uh, so, by the way, this is the first collapsar simulation back in 1999, a famous paper by McFadden and Woosley with magnetic fields back at that time, but they showed nicely how such a star uh, can sort of collapse to this uh, black hole um, accretion system. And then, uh, several years later, it has been tried with magnetic fields, um, so improved codes with magnetic fields. And uh, so in this case, a uh, paper by Komisarov in 2009, where uh, they so essentially approximated um, the initial conditions of the simulation by something that looks like um, a collapsing massive star, and they endowed this uh, sort of spherical um, distribution of mass with uh, um, uh, angular momentum just to sort of mimic um, uh, uh, an actual star. And they endowed this uh, initial condition, so this initial uh, material, stellar material, with um, a strong magnetic field. And that's, the, that's how they supplied the, the magnetic field under the black hole, finally. Um, so this originates from the, from the original star. <clears throat> and what they found is uh, that essentially, uh, once the accretion disk forms, most of this collapsing material, so the outer, uh, the outer layers of the star, so once the black hole forms and, and forms this accretion disk, some of the outer layers of the star have not yet realized that actually the inner parts were already collapsing and forming this black hole. Um, so until sort of this uh, uh, collapse propagates through all the layers of the star, that actually takes some time. Uh, and uh, so there's material continuously falling uh, onto this black hole accretion disk system. And sort of at late times, uh, due to the high angular momentum as well, uh, what happens is that essentially material that is in these, in these polar, um, sort of more in this, in this polar region, has low angular momentum and that quickly falls into the black hole and actually does not uh, sort of um, fall onto the accretion disk and surface rises simply because it doesn't have enough angular momentum to do so. So uh, sort of in these polar regions, uh, the, uh, the sort of infall infalling material clears up um, sort of a low density funnel fairly, fairly soon, um, whereas most of the material actually uh, falls in more sort of from the equatorial uh, directions. Uh, it falls in onto the disk, and from the disk it's, it's being accreted onto the, onto the black hole horizon. So you actually open up some sort of uh, uh, low density um, um, polar uh, sort of funnel or region. And <clears throat> in there, at some point, the uh, magnetic fields can actually dominate. The magnetic field energy can actually dominate over uh, the fluid energy. So this ratio of uh, rest mass uh, energy rho uh, c square over b square uh, becomes smaller than one. And this is often called the so-called so plasma beta parameter. Um, and that is sort of a uh, natural sort of uh, expectation for the, me uh, for the blandford snag mechanism uh, to operate and to work, uh, simply because uh, the conditions under which we, we found that mechanism was that uh, we needed magnetic fields, electric magnetic fields to dominate um, over, over matter. Um, we totally neglected any baryonic matter and, and the energy and momentum of, of, of that matter. Um, so the expectation is essentially that once the magnetic fields uh, dominate over uh, the matter, uh, we should in principle be able to, to launch such a blandford snag mechanism. And that's exactly what they found in the simulation, that at some point the density becomes low enough and uh, magnetic fields start to dominate. You have some magnetic flux that uh, threats the uh, ergosphere of the black hole. And they see here actually... Um, uh, um, a pointing flux, um, so magnetic, uh, um, electric magnetic energy, and uh, so this pointing flux actually is fairly powerful and uh, sort of opens this, this blob, this cavity, and sort of drives uh, uh, a shock into this um, uh, surrounding accreting material and sort of starts to make its way uh, through the rest of, of, the, of the envelope. And uh, that is what sort of is widely believed to, to be sort of the 
um, origin of, of, of an actual jet. That then at much further distances by the dissipation mechanisms and that Sylvia discussed as well, uh, would then produce the actual prompt emission and uh, the gamma ray burst. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, short gamma ray bursts, uh, so neutron star mergers. And uh, here, the uh, conditions are, uh, are fairly uh, complicated. Uh, so here, we don't have a collapsing star. We cannot produce a large-scale magnetic flux from, from the beginning. Um, instead, we, ha we have to hope that somehow we can create um, a strong colloidal field. So re uh, remember that the, uh, that the outgoing pointing flux that we found in this blanford snyke solution was proportional to the poloidal magnetic field. So what we'd hope for is that we, that we somehow supply the, the black hole with a strong poloidal magnetic field that can actually then give rise to some significant energy extraction. So in this case, we, we essentially have to rely on uh, strong magnetic fields being created by MHD turbulence in the disk that then are accreted onto the black hole horizon. And people have tried this with uh, binary neutron star merger simulations, also with neutron star black hole uh, simulations, and uh, sort of with uh, mixed outcomes, uh, in a sense. So there's been uh, um, sort of one group reported sort of successful results in the sense that uh, they collided two neutron stars, which promptly formed a black hole. Um, and the polar funnel fairly soon cleared up uh, into a low density medium and magnetic fields could fairly soon dominate. And uh, so they actually found an outflow, um, a magnetically dominated outflow um, with a pointing flux that is consistent with the expectations from the blanford snyke mechanism. Uh, however, other groups have tried to do the same exercise and, and simulate this, uh, fairly similar systems. Uh, for example, uh, this simulation here, um, or the simulation down here, where uh, I was involved too. And so what, uh, what was found there is that um, essentially on the timescales of, of interest uh, over the timescales that people could run the simulation, essentially no outflow and no uh, blanford snyke mechanism was actually activated. So there was not um, a significantly strong um, poloidal magnetic field being generated uh, that could actually drive some pointing flux and give rise to, uh, to an incipient jet uh, or something like this. So in, in general, so I'm happy to talk about the details later um, over coffee. I have to go fairly quickly over this because we also want to talk about um, GRB afterglow theory in just a, in just a minute. Uh, but sort of to make a long story short, uh, so jet formation um, and the activation of the blanford snyke mechanism in neutron star mergers is still not understood. I would say there's still um, a lot of work uh, to be done and, and things to be understood. Um, uh, also, uh, in, this, in these cases here, um, f especially in this case, um, this was only a case in which, uh, if you remember the uh, neutron star merger phenomenology that we discussed on Monday, um, this only applied to the case in which you promptly form um, a black hole. There are also other cases in which you have, uh, in which you form a hypermassive or supermassive neutron star that ac at least survives for tens of milliseconds um, or maybe hundreds of milliseconds. And in this case, the situation becomes even more challenging because in this case, you pollute the environment with a lot of baryonic material. And uh, so the magnetic fields don't dominate in these, in, these, in these regions. And to actually get the conditions in which uh, magnetic fields would dominate um, uh, are, are fairly hard to uh, achieve. So especially in this context where you form a long-lived neutron star that may actually survive on timescales of seconds or uh, hours or days or maybe even uh, sort of be entirely stable. Um, so these are simulations showing uh, sort of the immediate sort of aftermath of the merger of two neutron stars that formed a long-lived neutron star. Um, and so this is essentially showing up here these are velocities and down here I believe it's the density at yeah, pressure to, um, well you can, uh, it's kind of an indication for uh, density, in a sense, um, if, if, if you want. So you see the, the merger product in the, at the center. So now, OK, the pointer doesn't work anymore. 
Okay, so at the at the center, essentially, you see a long-lived neutron star. It's just like a tiny dot. You can't actually see it. It's not specially resolved in this in this figure, and uh, and surrounding that, you see a whole huge cloud of uh, very dense uh, material that uh, was ejected during this merger process, and that is still ejected. It's still being ejected as winds from this central remnant, and. Uh, in the other case, where you promptly collapse to a black hole, you can see that there is a funnel region clearing up above the black hole. And that is because uh, material with low angular momentum would then just fall onto the black hole. There's no pressure support from the interior. There's no neutron star and no winds that, that are coming from the center. Uh, the material just uh, falls onto the black hole and clears up that funnel. And in this case, you could hope that actually magnetic, that actually magnetic fields would dominate uh, at some point and launch a uh, blanford snag mechanism. But in, in this case, where you form uh, long-lived neutron stars, it's actually fairly challenging to achieve these, these conditions. So the basic question here is actually, um, how do you produce um, a blanford snag mechanism? How do you produce um, a short gamma ray burst in these, in these cases? That could be actually a significant fraction of all neutron star mergers, uh, depending on the binary parameters and, and the maximum mass for neutron stars or the equation of state that we, that we still uh, uh, don't know. Um, and even if you just uh, sort of assume that by some magic mechanism you, you, you could inject that in this, in this case, uh, driven by the neutron star or so, um, then even other hydrodynamic simulations show that for reasonable jet energies, uh, they would be actually joked by the uh, by this uh, sort of thick cloud of of, uh, of material, so it's actually a fairly a fairly challenging scenario, and that uh, just uh, leads me to discuss one one last point because also Sylvia discussed pl uh, plateaus in in X-ray light curves in the in the afterglow of uh, short GBs, and. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we actually looked into this into this problem of how uh, can you actually in in sort of this uh, environment where it's kind of hopeless to uh, uh, to find a blanford snag mechanism right away, how could you actually uh, um, still generate a short gamma ray burst? Well, here's one idea, um, and that will be fairly interesting to test in the future with uh, with future uh, detections by LIGO uh, and, and Virgo and, and the electromagnetic facilities. Uh, so Sylvia mentioned these these systems in which you have yeah, pointer really doesn't work. I need to we need to replace the batteries. Uh, uh, showed you uh, multiple examples where. Uh, in the afterglow light curve of uh, short GRBs, for example, uh, you'd, you'd have these sort of plateau phases uh, that last um, on timescales over hours or, or even uh, a little longer, and that are actually hard to explain by uh, just an um, uh, injection of a blanford snake jet um, on typical timescales of a, of a short GRB that are consistent with the, with the prompt emission. So uh, how can you reconcile this whole scenario um, because as I, as I mentioned in this case, uh, if, if that is actually driven by a neutron star, which is sort of the, what, what, was sort of the first interpretation of these data, uh, then the question from the, coming from the simulation is, how can you actually produce um, a jet under these conditions? And uh, so one idea is, is, is this one, that uh, maybe what actually happens is uh, you form this long-lived neutron star. Uh, there's a huge, fairly dense ejector cloud surrounding uh, that newly formed object. Um, and then at some point, this neutron star cools down, so the, the, the winds will sort of cease, the neutrino-driven winds will cease also the, the it will lose uh, differential rotation on the same time scale, so also the magnetically driven winds will stop. Um, so eventually this material will just sort of uh, expand and move away from this uh, merger site. In the center, you still have a rapidly rotating, uh, essentially uniformly rotating neutron star, um, uh, essentially uh, a magnetar, uh, strongly magnetized millisecond rotation, uh, rotating uh, object that then sets up its, its uh, magnetosphere, its pulsar magnetosphere. Um, um, and that sort of injects uh, a pulsar wind uh, behind these uh, expanding ejector uh, shells. And uh, so this uh, pulsar wind uh, feels then sort of the uh, confinement of, of this ejector envelope and uh, sets up what, what's called a pulsar wind nebula. Um, and the pressure of this pulsar wind nebula, this is just uh, um, essentially electrons and positrons and, and photons, if you want, so no baryonic material. Um, so we see this actually in other systems in, in supernova explosions. And sort of the hypothesis is here that we just see essentially fairly, fairly much the same phenomenon just on a very different sort of astrophysical context. 
And uh, so this, this pressure of this nebula is, is, is fairly high and drives a shock wave into the, into the surrounding ejector, which sweeps up essentially this whole ejector cloud into a thin shell eventually. Um, and interior to this thin shell, uh, you would just have um, baryon poor uh, material. There's only electrons, positrons, gammas. And um, uh, finally, the neutron star collapses uh, to a black hole on a spin down time scale once the magnetic field has slowed it down. Um, uh, far enough so that uh, it's losing its rotational support against gravitational collapse. Uh, so it's, it's, it's lost its uh, uh, rotational energy and uh, collapses to a black hole surrounded by some accretion torus, and that could then sort of eventually drive uh, a jet um, that will then sort of easily uh, drill through this uh, ejector cloud that has already expanded by many orders of magnitude and radius uh, to form um, eventually, uh, this sh uh, short GRB at actually fairly late time, so this can be um, sort of hours or uh, or even longer um, from merger to to the final ejection, to the, fo the final formation of the um, um, of the jet. But uh, already prior to collapse, uh, as this material is expanding away from the merger side, it is actually fairly hot and um, already radiates a lot of um, photons. Um, it could be initially in the X-rays and then sort of depending on the opacities and, uh, and the R process or other processes that are going on in there, uh, depending on the opacities, could also be at sort of longer wavelengths in the UV or down to the optical and sort of already produced some uh, emission, actually, as you can see there in the sketch, uh, prior to the prompt gamma rays. And uh, finally, once the jet is launched and, uh, and the short GRB is produced, there's still a lot of uh, energy stored in this nebula that has to diffuse out of the nebula and the ejector shell uh, on much longer time scales. And if you, you can sort of uh, compute the basic diffusion time for sort of uh, photons out of, from this nebula out of the nebula and the ejector shell, and that diffusion time scale is uh, on the same order as the typical observed um, uh, dura durations of these afterglow plateaus. So the idea is essentially that you have some sort of precursor emission that is already maybe in the X-ray, UV, or optical, and then you have a gamma ray uh, um, burst, and then you have uh, this sort of X-ray plateau afterwards. Um, so that would be sort of a scenario in which you can reconcile the findings from the numerical simulations in case you form uh, a long-lived uh, neutron star with the blanford nyack mechanism, um, all together with the X-ray plateaus that are, that are found in many of the swift um, short GRBs. All right. Um, and uh, obviously, then, there would be a long delay time between the actual sort of gravitational wave signal that LIGO or Virgo would measure and the short GRB uh, signal then detected by some gamma ray satellites like uh, Fermi or Swift. And as I said, this can be on the order of uh, timescales of minutes to hours. Um, so it would be actually fairly interesting in the future with uh, uh, more events to actually see the time delay between the gravitational wave signal and the electromagnetic counterparts because that can actually potentially tell us something about the central engine uh, of short GBs. So that will sort of already make some basic constraints. And uh, so I'm uh, sort of eagerly lo looking to, uh, forward to, uh, uh, to the next uh, kind of detections. But that's something we can, we can test in the future. All right, I, I have to stop here because uh, I also want to talk about uh, theory for uh, GRB afterglows. And so let's get started on this. So the final part of uh, my lectures will be on GRB afterglows. Um, so theory for essentially the synchrotron emission, the broadband synchrotron emission that we see in GRB afterglows. <laughs> or uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, then let's get let's get started with uh, okay. So in today's lecture, I will describe and discuss uh, relativistic blast waves. So essentially, the hydrodynamics. 
of, um, of a DRB, of a DRB explosion. So we discussed a lot about the central engine so far. And now we just assume we have some sort of central engine that provides some sort of explosion. So some jet that uh, uh, gave rise to some um, ultra-relativistic uh, explosion. And what we're interested in is to see uh, and understand the aftermath of, of such an explosion and what this explosion does to the environment and what we can actually observe uh, from that interaction. So uh, let's consider this basic setup So, as I said, we have some sort of uh, explosion, and we are totally agnostic about what it ac what it, how it was actually produced. Yes. The lights, uh, sure. How do I do this? The first one. Fantastic. Thank you. And by the way, if you can if you can read anything or so, if I'm writing too small, just let me know. Um, so we are agnostic about what actually what has actually driven the explosion. Uh, so explosion, and we assume it's impulsive in the sense that uh, we just inject some amount of energy E over a fairly short time scale, and uh, so we don't we don't have like continuous energy injection or so. And this explosion will create a blast wave that runs into the interstellar medium surrounding that explosion site, so the ISM. And uh, let's say it has density uh, N. And we also assume it's cold, so essentially pressureless. So essentially internal energy and also the pressure essentially vanishes. It's a cold medium. And uh, we assume that this blast wave is uh, ultra-relativistic, so it's actually moving with high Lorentz factors. Let's denote the, uh, essentially the velocity by u, uh, and then writing this uh, as a four vector, uh, we just have the Lorentz factor gamma, and then gamma times the velocity, and we assume it's radial, right? So there's no uh, spherical symmetry, so there's only an r component, but no theta and phi components. And uh, so the rest of this lecture essentially will be about how to understand uh, the hydrodynamic evolution of such a blast wave. And then tomorrow we'll discuss how this uh, blast wave gives rise to synchrotron emission and how that um, sort of gives us a model at hand that we can fit to GRB afterglows uh, in order to understand uh, their afterglows, their broadband afterglows, all the way from the X-rays to the radio and uh, sort of in applying this model to the data, what kind of parameters uh, we can infer from the system and what we can tell about uh, the explosion that actually happened. So we'll construct this solution in essentially in three steps. So we will derive first the local properties of such a shock wave. So local shock properties. Then we'll quickly sort of derive the equations of hydrodynamics. In spherical symmetry. And then finally, we will actually construct a solution to these equations by imposing the local properties that we already know. So we'll construct actually a self-similar, what is called a self-similar solution by imposing the local properties. OK, let's start with the first point. And uh, that brings me to relativistic shocks. And, and Lewis has already uh, discussed some of this. Um, 
local shock properties. So let's just imagine we sit uh, on this blast wave somewhere here locally, and locally this is just sort of a plane wavefront that moves outwards with a sort of normal vector that we uh, call n, uh, n mu. And uh, so this shock will be this continuity in, in the hydrogen variables uh, moving at, as I said, some shock speed. Um, let's call actually this, uh, we'll actually choose a co coordinate frame in this unshocked ISM material and the, uh, the Lorentz factor of the shock uh, will then be denoted by uh, this uh, capital gamma. And let's say the fluid properties in this unshocked medium, the unshocked ISM, are rho 1, p1, e1, gamma 1, and so on. And this is, so, so this is region 1 in a sense. This is region 2. That's the shocked region. And here we'd have rho 2, p2, e2, gamma 2, and so on and so forth. So, you know uh, that the continuity in mass and energy momentum flux has to be preserved across the shock front. So, in other words, the two conditions that have to be preserved are that the max mass flux be continuous and the energy momentum flux, uh, sorry, it has to be protected onto, uh, onto the normal vector, so across the shock front. And by this bracket, I just mean that uh, that any quantity f is just the uh, difference between the left side and and the right side. So this just tells us the mass and the energy momentum flux um, are conserved across the shock front. Um, we'll choose a co coordinate frame. Uh, that is at rest with the ISM, so that is co-moving with the, with the ISM, we'll assume an ideal fluid. So as Lewis already mentioned yesterday, the energy momentum tensor is then uh, given by rho, so the density one plus epsilon, which is the specific internal energy so internal energy per unit mass. And then we have the four velocities here. Eta mu nu, which is the uh, Minkowski metric, and uh, the, uh, the pressure. And it's just defined that the energy density should be denoted by E which is rho times 1 plus epsilon, so the rest mass, plus the internal energy. And then also the enthalpy will denote it by W, E plus P. Okay, and we'll also assume that the equation of state is, is that of an uh, ideal gas, which means, I also think that Louis mentioned this already yesterday, is the uh, adiabatic index minus one times uh, rho epsilon. And we'll assume that we have a strong shock. So we're looking at an ultra-relativistic explosion uh, and by this assumption, we just mean that the pressure divided by the uh, density, 
is much, much on the sort of shocked fluid side, is much, much bigger than on the unshocked uh, side. And then you can show as an exercise that these two conditions, one and two, under these assumptions, lead to jump conditions. in the following way. Where again, all the twos and ones, all these indices refer to either side of the, uh, of the shock front. And then the Lorentz factor of the shock front, as seen from the unshocked ISM side, is given by gamma 2 plus 1 adiabatic index evaluated on the shocked side, gamma 2 minus 1 plus 1 squared, divided by, again, the adiabatic index on the shocked side, times 2 minus gamma adiabatic gamma 2 minus 1 plus 2. And as I mentioned, we're actually interested in the ultra-relativistic limit. So we can further simplify those. So these are still fairly general, uh, apply to any uh, strong shock. If we additionally assume the ultra-relativistic limit, meaning that the shock is moving at very high Lorentz factor. We also assume that we have a radiation-dominated gas, which is essentially exactly this idea of having a fireball explosion, um, high entropy material, where uh, radiation uh, dominates then the adiabatic index is four-thirds. And that implies that the pressure is actually given uh, by one-third of the uh, internal energy. In this limit, we can these relations become very simple. The pressure on the shocked side is simply given by two-thirds Lorentz factor of the shock squared and then the enthalpy on the unshocked side. The density on the shocked side, as seen from the unshocked side, which I denote here by this prime, is given by two times the Lorentz factor squared and the density on the unshocked side. And the condition for the Lorentz factors are the following. So these are very simple jump conditions. Uh, locally. Okay. Um, they essentially characterize this blast wave locally. Now let's see what this blast wave has to satisfy uh, globally. So, hydro in spherical symmetry. Well, you know, the energy momentum, so the, the mass, so first let's, let's talk about the mass flux. So, the baryon number conservation, as Lewis pointed out yesterday, is given by this equation and the energy momentum conservation is given by the divergence of the energy momentum tensor. And uh, we just evaluate these equations, uh, assuming we have uh, spherical polar coordinates, and then you can write these uh, expressions in 
following form where plus one over r squared and then one over d by dr r squared n prime u where n prime is gamma times the density n. And uh, you can go on. Uh, I won't write them all down explicitly um, because they're simply lengthy uh, uh, expressions. Uh, you can fairly easily work them out yourself, just uh, assuming that you're in, in spherical polar coordinates. Um, the important point to make here is that you can simplify these equations much further and then they become fairly handy. So again, if we assume here that we have a radiation-dominated gas, meaning a fireball, exploding fireball, then we plug this in into these equations, we can actually write them in a fairly handy form, namely the following, where d by dt is now a total derivative, which I'll write down in a second, pressure over density to the power of four thirds equals zero, and then d by dt gamma to the four p equals gamma squared, and then partial derivative of the pressure with respect to time and d by dt of the logarithm of gamma to the power of 4, p to the power of 3, equals minus 4 over r squared, d by dr, r squared, u. And so d by dt here is uh, simply the total derivative. So if you have any function y, it means first the partial derivative of y with respect to t, because sort of we assume here that everything depends on the radial coordinate and also on time. And then you have the second term, which is simply dy by dr, dr by dt. So dy by dt plus velocity times y by dr. Uh, sorry, I, I was denoting this by u, just to be consistent. So this is uh, what is sometimes called a convective or material derivative. So, uh, and now let's note the following. We want to compute the local energy of a given solution to these equations, because uh, that will be an important expression um, that characterizes our uh, blast wave and, and how we construct actually the self-similar solution. So the energy density, essentially the zero, zero component of the energy momentum tensor, which is given by, if you evaluate this for the energy momentum tensor that I've written down, meanwhile erased, um, minus p, and then we get four gamma squared minus one times p, and again, if we apply the ultra relativistic limit, we can just, just have four gamma squared p, so then the sort of instantaneous energy of any solution to the spherical hydro simulate uh, to the spherical hydro uh, equations can be expressed as so energy at time t between some inner radius 
uh, that we just keep as a variable are in and some outer radius are out. I should... Uh, write this up here. So in simply the integral over this energy density between the two radii, so r in to r out, and then from the angular integration we'll have in the end 16 pi, and then gamma squared pressure radius squared dr. So that relation will be useful later. That's the total internal energy of any solution between two given radii. Okay, uh, now comes part three. We construct the solution to these equations that are absolutely general by imposing the local shock properties uh, that we discussed earlier. So again, we assume a spherical shock front and that must satisfy the local uh, jump conditions. And we'll also assume that this blast wave is actually adiabatic. And it's actually well satisfied for uh, DRBs. And by that I mean, so adiabatic blast wave By which I mean that energy losses uh, through radiation, so through the eventual synchrotron emission that we'll see from this blast wave, are actually negligible uh, to the kinetic and internal energy of that solution. Um, adiabatic blast wave, and uh, so this leads us to look for solutions of the form gamma squared proportional to time to the power of minus m, where for, for now we just keep m as a, as a general variable. m has to be greater than minus 1. And the motivation here is, and we'll see this in a second, is that for an adiabatic blast wave, we'll, we'll show this in a second, um, actually, gamma squared times t to the power of 3 is actually constant. So, and so this we'll show later means that the total energy of the blast wave uh, is conserved. And change so deviating from this in uh, from this uh, t to minus three just by leaving m open, we also allow solutions in which we actually continuously inject energy. So we where we don't have just an impulsive explosion, but also some central engine that also even after the initial explosion still supplies energy to that blast wave. Um, we won't then in the end actually uh, look at those uh, uh, solutions, um, but uh, for now let's just keep it as. Um, as an open uh, variable here. So, with this assumption, we can write the radius of the shock front in the following way. So, the radius as a function of t, so the capital R is now the radius of the shock front. that is simply given by integrating over its velocity. So we just integrate from zero 
to some time t, the velocity of this shock front dt. So this is 1 minus 1 over gamma squared dt. And that up to leading order in gamma squared, because we assume that gamma squared is much, much bigger than 1, so um, ultra-relativistic, we get t times 1 minus 1 over 2m plus 1 gamma squared. So that's also a useful um, observation. So now the idea in order to get the pressure density profiles as a solution of these hydro equations is the following. So this is sort of our ansatz for constructing the global solution. Impose local properties and assume the solution is separable into a, what we call, cell-similar cell similarity, similarity variable. And um, so that we can essentially write the pressure as a function of radius and time t as two thirds w1 gamma squared. And then we just make an ansatz that the spatial dependence, the spatial and time dependence, actually is factored out into some separable function f. Um, that only depends on this, on this variable chi that somehow relates to R and T in a way that I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, and then we'll write down the ansatz for the gamma, for the Lorentz factor of, of, the shock, of the shock fluid on this side. It's one half gamma squared G of chi, and then we have the final relation for density profile, that is 2 n gamma squared h of chi, and then we impose that f at of 1 equals g of 1 equals h of 1 equals 1. So you can see that we just took these uh, local jump conditions in the ultra-relativistic limit. And we assume that uh, the global solution for all radii and times t is essentially given by these shock conditions and then some separable part that only that sort of captures the, the time and the space dependence. And so I'll show write down what this chi variable is. I'll keep the energy expression. And then you'll see what, what we mean by uh, self-similarity. So chi, and that is a little unintuitive at first sight, but I'll explain this in a second. Uh, we'll define this one. And then again, you can use the radius expression down there up to orders of 
gamma to the minus power of minus two, and you'll have one plus two m plus one gamma squared one minus r and t. And by the way, uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, so this is essentially this sort of famous Blanford and McKee solution uh, back from 1976 that we're deriving here. Um, this is the self-similarity variable that they proposed back then. And let me just interpret this a little bit. So in general, chi will be greater or equal than one. And evaluating this at the shock front of the um, at the uh, at the radius of the shock front, meaning r equals so small r equals capital R, uh, we have that chi is one. And away from the shock front, chi is roughly given by capital R minus small r divided by t. We're away from the shock front. And that essentially captures the, this idea of self-similarity. So self-similarity just tells us that in principle, uh, the shock front is dictated by these local uh, jump conditions. Um, and they sort of don't know anything about the global solution. And so the idea here is essentially that in principle, this blast wave should look the same or say it should look similar on all spatial scales, uh, meaning then also on all uh, time scales. And the solution that describes this blast wave essentially should only depend on the shock front itself and then the relative distance away from this, uh, uh, from this shock front. And this is exactly what this variable here captures. It only matters essentially how far we are away from the shock front are um, at a given time t. And that essentially captures all the information uh, that we should know. And uh, therefore, the solution should only sort of depend on this ratio. So that is essentially the, the basic idea. And if we apply this, um, so if we make this ansatz and plug it into the uh, general equations um, in spherical hydro that uh, I already uh, erased, uh, you'll see that in the end, we can actually simplify these partial differential equations into just a set of uh, ordinary differential equations. And you'll see that these equations are entirely scale-free. They only depend on these scale-free quantities that we introduced here, namely this uh, still to be determined function f, g, and h as a function of this self-similarity -similar variable, and also an m which characterizes um, the energy ejection um, over time. Yes. Yeah, that's also something in principle you could do. So this is just a very simple sort of physical approach where uh, um, you use the jump conditions to construct um, to construct an analytic um, um, solution. Um, there may be other ways in which uh, you can you can of course uh, solve the equations with more or less effort, um, uh, certainly more effort. Um, but uh, sort of this is a fairly simple way of constructing analytically this blast wave solution. And you'll have the same thing uh, for this uh, function g. And then a similar equation uh, for h. Um, and OK, I'll have enough space here. I'll fit this here. And then sort of Blanford and McKee back in 76 showed that these equations have a fairly simple solution. Um, in the case of m equals uh, 3, namely for the adi adiabatic blast wave, which we're interested in. So simple solution for adiabatic blast wave, meaning m equals 3. And the solution is very simple, surprisingly simple. And then we find that H is actually 
Kite oder minus 7 fourths, 7 over 4. So, simple power laws. So now let's compute the energy. You can also erase this. Maybe I'll keep these for now. Okay, so now if you evaluate this uh, expression for the energy of the blast wave, uh, knowing that the solution for, for the pressure looks, uh, looks like this, you can simply plug in the, the expression for F here. We get that the instantaneous blast wave energy is given by E, and then simply integrate 16 pi gamma squared P R. Yeah, we have it already there. And you, and you can show setting in all these things. You can do this as an exercise. Uh, do the simple integral, and you'll get 8 pi over 17. W1, so that is the enthalpy of the ISM, the gamma of the uh, shock front to the power of 2 and t to the 3. And now we can actually see that, as I mentioned earlier, gamma squared times time to the power of 3 equals constant is equivalent to having an adiabatic uh, blast wave, meaning that E is constant. And that motivated us to make this ansatz in the first place about the, uh, about the behavior of uh, the Lorentz factor scaling with, uh, uh, scaling with time. Yeah, there's a question here. Say, say again? Oh, sorry, yeah, that is wrong. Yeah, you're right, sorry. I, I, was, already <laughs> I was already here. Uh, that, of course, should be the that should be the shock, um, the shock radius, of course. Thanks. That is a typo. Um, okay. In the last uh, seven minutes, let us uh, quickly discuss how an observer very far away from this blast wave will actually see this blast wave. Um, so this is a relativistically moving blast wave, and that observer will, the way this observer will notice this blast wave is because this blast wave at the shock front will heat up the material that it sweeps up, and that heat will be uh, injected in uh, accelerations of electrons and, and positrons behind the shock front. And there will be small-scale magnetic fields, and these electrons will uh, produce synchrotron emission um, uh, gyrating in these uh, uh, magnetic fields. So they will emit uh, synchrotron photons. We'll discuss this uh, tomorrow. And so they will emit photons, and it's because of these photons that an observer will see the, the blast wave, of course. And uh, since it's moving relativistically, um, we have to take the time of flight of, the, of these photons into account, and that leads to some um, observer effects that I'm going to discuss right now. So the fourth point is blast wave as seen by distant observer. So, okay, so imagine we have this uh, scenario again. So I'll just uh, draw it again because otherwise it'll, it'll get confusing at some point. So let's see, we, let's say we have this expanding blast wave with Lorentz factor gamma. 
And let's say this is radius r1, this is radius r2 at some later time. Let's say this is at time zero. And let's say there's synchrotron emission radiated from the shock front at time zero. And we have a distant observer at a large distance, so astronomical distance d. Then the photon that's emitted at time t0 will be received by the observer at time t1. So let's see, say photon emission occurs at radius r1 and t0. So it'll be received by the observer at time t1, which is t0, plus simply the time of flight of this photon, right? Now imagine we emit another photon from the shock front at R2, at some later time, T0 plus R2 minus R1 over the uh, velocity of the shock front. Let's stay consistent and use uh, U here. Then it'll be received at time T2, which is simply T0 plus, uh, sorry, um, the travel time of the shock front and then simply the time of flight of the photon once it's emitted from the front uh, to reach the observer. So the observer will actually see a time difference between these two photons, T2 minus T1, and sort of plugging these expressions in, you'll find that this is one and beta is here u divided, oops, sorry, u divided by c. Uh, and again, in the ultra relativistic limit, which we are interested in here, you can write this in the following way. Okay, so that's the time difference between two uh, sort of arbitrary photons at different radii, as seen by the observer. So if we take the limit of this inner radius going to zero, so to the origin, um, meaning um, a photon emitted essentially by, by the explosion, then we find the following, that the observer given by simply the integral of this dr over 2c and then gamma squared of r. And sort of roughly, we can approximate this by 4c gamma squared, where again, I used the condition the jump condition that the shock velocity as seen, the shock uh, Lorentz factor as seen from the ISM is simply two times the actual, uh, um, um, the actual Lorentz factor of the fluid moves behind the, the shock front. And so finally, Let's see, I'll erase this. So let's denote this expression here by star. 
and introducing this relation between the Lorentz factor of the uh, shocked fluid and uh, the radius of the shock front and this observer time, we can sort of plug this in into this expression here of the energy of the blast wave. So this will be the energy of the blast wave essentially as measured or as seen by this distant observer. So we can, so okay, let's first rewrite this um, just a little bit. And uh, so this is just this expression um, making the following assumption that we have a cold and pressureless ISM So this means that the internal energy is essentially zero, negligible, as is its pressure. And that means that the enthalpy W1 of the ISM is simply the rest mass uh, energy. So the speed of light is here set to one um, uh, in this case. So or let, let's put it here, rho c squared. Um, and that is, gives us the factor of c squared here. And uh, so now, using this relation between observer time, the radius, and the Lorentz factor, we get the following expressions. The radius of the shock front of the explosion, as seen by the distant observer, is given by 17 over the energy of the explosion, which is constant, by divided by 4 pi rho, which is which is simply right here as the proton mass. We just assume that we have a single, uh, essentially hydrogen gas surrounding the merger site, times the particle density n uh, times the speed of light and then to the power of 1 over 4. And then the observer time, again, also to the power of 1 fourth. So E here is exactly this blast wave energy. So this is the energy of our GRB or what is often called the isotropic equivalent kinetic energy of, of this burst. And uh, solving, solving, so using this expression in here and just solving for the Lorentz factor instead of, uh, instead of the shock radius, the observer will see the material behind the shock front, this material here, moving with a Lorentz factor given by 17e, 1024 <laughs> pi. Again, proton mass, number density of hydrogen atoms, we have c to the power of 5, and then scaling with 1 over 8 observing time minus 3 over 8. So these are very useful scalings. And uh, knowing that the observer will see the shock front moving exactly in that way will allow us uh, tomorrow to actually compute the synchrotron emission from that blast wave. And uh, that's the uh, program uh, for tomorrow. And uh, time is up. Um, so we'll stop here. Are there still questions before lunch? Or? All right, good. Then let's have lunch.